you know, few nuggets of wisdom. So we want to deal with the topic today, Christ is bigger than any crisis. Let me try again. Hopefully I will have a, a proper Christian amen. Christ is bigger than any crisis. So that will be our topic, and then we are in the book of 2 Kings chapter 6, we will read from verse 24 to 33, uh, and then we will get straight into the sharing of the word. 2 Kings 6, <clears throat> 24 to 33. Would you, would you read? Uh, the early service people did very, very well reading and praying and otherwise, so we are more than them. So let's try better what they did. One, two, three. This is one of those extremely, extremely sad stories in the Bible that sometimes you think, did the writer just made up a little story to explain a point or did it really happen? I don't know in the room if there's anybody, you know, I'm talking about women who have carried a pregnancy for nine months or eight or seven, whatever uh, amount of months to carry the pregnant pregnancy. Would you lift up your hand? Good, a few of you. So, when you give birth, that child becomes everything to you. I remember many years ago, T.D. Jakes would give a preaching, and then uh, during his preaching, he said his children were very little, very, very small, and they were fast asleep when a cry from a child, piercing cry, came from the child's bedroom. T.D. Jack said, in the middle of my sleep, I jump out of bed. I begin to run toward my baby's room. My feet were not touching the ground. You know, I don't know. You know, it's, it's go ask him. <laughs> it's a dramatic, but he was driving a point. Because he said, as I was driving toward that bedroom, I had only one mind, thing in mind. To kill anything, anybody that I'll find in my baby's room. 
because that's how important a child is to a parent. And here's a story where a mother, not even a father, a mother is pushed to do things that are counter nature. The killing of a child is not that, you know, by mistake you stabbed your child or you hit the child in, in anger somewhere and then the child is dead, you start, you know, regretting. But this is a purposeful killing. Where you grab your own child who came out of your loins, whatever age the child was, and then you kill it. You cut it into pieces, put in a pot, cook it until it's well cooked. You serve the child and you begin to eat with your neighbor. With an intention of tomorrow, we will take your child and do the same. How can a parent, and especially a mother, be a cannibal to that level? Crosses make people do desperate things. But the issue of crosses is it's bound to come as long as you're alive. So therefore, you might as well learn how to deal with this thing called a crisis because it happens, small or big, major or any other way. There will be times of very intense pressure, very intense you know, difficulties, very intense problems and, 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 and changes. When these things happen, how do you deal? Now, something quickly. You know, the premise from which you operate is simple. Crises by nature are often opportunities in disguise. That's something everybody in this room have to learn. Whatever times of difficulties that you're going through, whether it's in the finance area, whether it's relationship area, whether it's, uh, you know, health area, when it's, you know, whatever thing, you've lost your job, or like now at the national level in Zimbabwe, what is going on at South Africa, economy, and many other things, <clears throat> excuse me, Syria, you know, genocide and war, whatever crisis is a, it's, it's an opportunity. Opportunity to learn something or to unlearn something. Opportunity to do something or undo something. Opportunity to adjust, adjust your trajectory. Opportunities to connect or disconnect. Every crisis pushes you to do certain things that otherwise you will never do. But you have to learn how to handle crisis in a proper way. A crisis easy? No. That's what they're called crisis. But can we handle them? Oh yeah, you bet. We can. Any crisis. Now, especially when you're a child of God and you're handling a crisis, you are even at a bigger advantage because with God on your side, many seemingly impossible challenges can be turned around. So my purpose today is to tell you, you can turn around anything in your life. Amen. No, thank you for those weak amen. You know, especially you who are going through stuff, it's your message. You can turn around anything in your life. Amen. Even when your husband becomes demon-possessed, you can still turn around the situation. Amen. You begin to learn. Life is not that much about what happens to us, but it's about what happens in us. The defeat in crisis is not the crisis itself, but the emotion that you are buying into when you go through crisis. So let's deal with negative emotions that crisis tend to, you know, trigger uh, in people's lives, and then we will move swiftly to the what needs to be done. <clears throat> You be careful, because once crisis hits, when things begin to go wrong, the first thing that the crisis does is not changing the landscape of things around you, but is deforming you from inside. It triggers the most defeating emotions ever. And that way, the battle with crisis has to start. Let me mention some for the sake of time. The first one is confusion. Many of us, when something goes wrong, you get confused. <laughs> Remember Mr. Uh, uh, Gideon? 
The angel of the Lord rocks up and calls him mighty warrior. How does he react? He goes, gee, if I'm a, if I'm a mighty warrior, if God is for us, why are all these things happening to us? Wrong question. If you live your life with the why question, you will always be disappointed. There are things that happen that cannot be explained with why. Why a baby who's born in a Christian home dies suddenly? Day one. Why would you lose your job when you didn't do something wrong? Why does the relationship you invested in for 20 years, 25, 30 years, 10 years, suddenly out of no explanation go south? Why would you save your money, deprive yourself from luxury and stuff, and then suddenly the economy of the whole land goes down, and the money that was worth something is worth nothing? Why would the man you invested emotion in, looking for, dreaming about the day that you'll walk the aisle, and finally to stand before a priest who will pronounce your husband and wife, and then out of the blue, walks out on you? How would you explain that the person that you trusted with everything else after 20, 30 years of marriage comes to you and says, my wife, I'm so sorry, I have to break this news. I've been living a double life. I've got a wife with three kids. <laughs> oh, yeah, things happen. <laughs> I was in Brussels many years ago, maybe 12, 10, 11 years ago, preaching for Pastor Guillain. And I preached a message, I don't know what I said exactly. And after that, a young, uh, an elderly lady, very, very short of stature, wanted to see me. And eventually, she came, she said, my son, you might not know me. So when a lady calls you my son, she knows her age, especially when you've been preaching. <laughs> say, my son, you might not know me, but all my life, my husband was an ambassador of our country, trusted man to the president. I traveled everywhere with my husband, every single day. But now that you've retired, we realize that a big chunk of money is lost. And I start pressing only to discover that he has a wife in London with kids almost my, my children age. Can you explain to me where was he making babies and where was I? <laughs> Would you turn to your neighbor and say, you think you have a crisis? <laughs> oh, no, 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 don't turn to the other neighbor. You know, so, come on, please. Really? Because if you don't live long enough, you will make your 20 rands that you lost a big thing. I cannot understand. How can I be happy? 20 rands lost. 20 rand. And you throw a funeral around 20 rand? Really? Are you serious? You can make 20 rand. How about that guy who was just crossing, not knowing what will happen, and they can knock him out of the blue, he becomes paralyzed in one second. And you're crying over your 20, right? Come on, tell your neighbor, get a grip. No, 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 that, that neighbor is not anointed. Speak to the other neighbor. Now, I learn as I grow in life that you can make a small problem a big one because crises are not really the issue. It's the emotion that you're allowed to, to be triggered when something happens that makes the issue worse. The first one that makes many, many people go south is confusion. If people don't act confused, the second thing they do is desperation. People behave in a desperate manner. Any person who's desperate does desperate things. Do you know that 90% of times we get into debt out of desperation? That all you could do is to wait for four days. All you could do is to wait for a week because then the 25th you will be paid. You just need to change your diet. 
between now and a payday. That's all you need. Move back to eating bread and sugary water. You will not be in debt. But because you are desperate, you are swapping a card that you cannot afford. And one meal, you pay it the price of three because you are desperate. You don't need to go in debt because someone is throwing a party. You know what? I'm going to do a wedding that I'm looking forward to do and uh, mixed emotions. You know, Janet is one of our daughters that we really, really love with all our heart. But you know what? I'm not getting married. She's getting married. I will not buy new clothes. Janet, I'm, wa- I'm warning you already. I'll come with my old suit. You know, if it doesn't please you, you better buy me a new suit. Desperation is the second problem when you go through crisis. You begin to be desperate, and desperate people do desperate things that you regret. Oh, I know you will not say amen for, for your neighbor to not know it's you, but you know in your heart that I am the one the bishop is talking about. Third negative emotion that you feed people, fear. Many people, when they hit crisis, they begin to be afraid. And we know all psychologically, fear paralyzes your capacity to think about possibilities. I don't want to trivialize the issue. You know, rape itself is very, very terrible. I don't wish it on anybody. But sometimes I'm shocked when they bring rapists, how small they are, how weak they look. And I go, how can this thing rape such a woman? But you know what? It's that little knife that makes a difference. Come on, follow me. Follow, come here. If you move on. All you need is to punch that thing in her nose and then he's on the floor. But if you don't overcome fear, what you can potentially defeat will defeat you. It's exams time. It's appropriate for me to talk about exams. Let's face it. What is an exam? Oh, let me come this side. Maybe I've got a Christian. What is an exam? It's simply a measuring test to to tell you how much you understood from what you were taught. Now, is it is it necessary for you to panic? No. Sure, tomorrow exam. Sure, tomorrow exam. Sure, we're writing tomorrow. So what? If you don't write tomorrow, you will write one day. So you better write it as soon as possible. And once you take that paper in a spirit of fear, your brain shuts. Have you ever been in an exam when you write and you do mistakes? As you cross that door to go out, every answer comes back. (laughs) You go, but I knew number one, I knew number three too, number four too. What happened? Fear. When you hit a crisis, the first thing the devil does is to amplify the gravity of what you're facing. And fear steps in and makes you unable to think proactively, think solution. Oh, I was prepared already in prayer that I will have a quiet church, but it's okay. I can handle a minute of quiet. How about guilt? Another terrible, terrible emotion that happens to people when you hit a crisis, especially of relationship nature. Guilt sets in. Have you been in a situation where your child misbehaves or he goes off into drugs or she, she's pregnant? The first thing a parent does is to condemn themselves. Maybe I did something wrong. You didn't. 
Listen, the first rebellious guy was Lucifer. And Lucifer rebelled in the presence of Almighty God, the purest of all gods. What did God do? Nothing. Judas was given everything. Judas rebelled. What did Jesus do? Nothing. There are times in life where bad things happen. It's not your fault. Oh, maybe she dumped me because I, I wasn't romantic enough. Really? Now, brother, you want to kill yourself to keep that woman. Now, listen, you're my fiancé. I love you. But don't push me to speak to you in King James for you to know that I love you. Thou alone art thou. You know, no, 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 no. Actually, every relationship that becomes high maintenance is draining. Thank you. Thank you. Somebody's born again. Thank you. Every relationship in life that becomes high maintenance. That you have to walk on your toe. You have to think of stuff to say. You have to think what to not say. You have to think how to sit. That is a problem. But you know, when a relationship goes wrong, especially people like us pastors, someone leaves the church, the first reaction is to blame yourself. Maybe I didn't do pastor's visitation. Maybe I didn't fast for them enough. Maybe I didn't preach the good message. Maybe I didn't smile enough. Sometimes our, our, our job makes us to be bizarre. The moment someone looks at you, how are you doing, my sister? But you know it's, it's not normal. You know. This is not the YBF, but all that is to keep a member. Hello. Your dog, how is the dog doing? I go, Bishop, I don't have any dog. Oh, it's not you, it's, uh, it's brother. So all that, it's just, and I, but this is what I learned. And I've been around church for way, way too long in leadership. This is what I learned. The people you invest a lot in end up leaving. End up leaving the church. I carried a family stuff on my head. Mattress and everything has to move them houses. Believe it or not. Me, as you see. <laughs> carried mat mattress of a church member. The very next week when they moved to a new house, they moved. Oh, yes. I invested time and energy in a young man and did everything else. Mama was there, you know. He called me one day and he used to call me dad, which was very commendable. Can I see you with mama? And I thought, you know, someone wants to see you with mama. It's maybe a private mat and stuff. And he came with his wife, the four of us. I will not, never forget in my office in town. And he looked me and I said, Dad, you've been very good to me. You know, I've learned, learned a lot from you. But at the level where I'm functioning now, oh. your church doesn't have anything, doesn't have any more anything to offer to me. I need to go to a church where I can be challenged at this level. She was there, the wife, and the wife says, this is not the way you talk to pastor. So, but he's my dad. I have to tell him the truth. <laughs> oh, you've never been a pastor. <laughs> you've never been. That's why when people go crazy on me, I just go, well, no, this job we're doing, you, you know in your conscience I'm not wrong. But you have to apologize. <laughs> sorry, brother. <laughs> sorry, brother. Sister, sorry. It will never happen again. Now, what did I do? I, I, I don't know. You know. I must have done something that made him so angry. So if you're not careful when a crisis hits, especially at the relationship level, you get into guilt and condemnation. It's a wrong. Listen, 
We are all pro relationship. I live, I dream, I do all relationship. But when it cannot work anymore, I'm sorry, it cannot work anymore. It's, it's just the way it is. If I can fix, I fix. But if, if it's beyond my fixing, I ask God grace to go over it. Amen. That leads us to one of the last, most deadliest uh, negative emotion that crisis trigger. It's anger. Man, when things don't go right, anger just erupts in your soul. And if you don't control anger, especially if you're angry against God, oh no, you will never say amen because, you know, you are too afraid of God and you are too coward to admit that you are angry at God. But you know that many times you get angry at God. God, where were you when I was studying hard? And you allowed me to fail when that guy drinks and know him and he's cum laude. Lord, how can you explain that this lady, I know she's a loose lady, she sleeps with everything that moves around, and yet she's married, and I kept myself, nobody even looks at me. You can live in the house of God, angry at God. You go to church because you are used to going to church. But how do you punish God? By not giving him the worship that he deserves. I'll go to your church. Don't count on me in serving. Don't count on me in giving. Don't count on me on this and this. I'll punish you by not giving, by not serving, by not doing anything. And the reason why you come to church is a malicious thing to make God feel how it feels like for me to sit and do nothing for you. Oh, tell your neighbor the bishop is a prophet. No, 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 tell your neighbor the bishop is a prophet. Because, you know, if, if, if I don't go to church, God will know that I'm angry. Let me go to church. Let him feel what it feels like to be there and do nothing for him. Because where was he when I needed him? All these emotions are triggered by crisis. But you are not one of those. You are a child of God. Amen. Jesus is your Savior. God is on your side. So when God is with you and you are hitting a crisis, there's a proper way to handle. When Yahweh is on your side, I've got a quick five steps that can help you turn around any crisis because Christ is bigger than any crisis. Number one, decide to always adopt the correct attitude regardless of the situation you find yourself in. Why is the issue of, of attitude so powerful? Because attitude in life is everything. Your attitude will always determine your altitude. You can never rise in life above your thinking capacity. Not in terms of in intelligence, but, you know, the emotion when you're faced with issues. Now, I shared with a friend in the early service, and I want to share with you quickly. There's a number of things that I put in place myself, you know, because I, I, I just decide I'm not, a, you know, a bin where every junk has to be dumped. You know, I'm, I'm a vessel that God has to use. I have to be pure. I have to be clean. But how do I keep myself clean when I do a job of high risk where betrayal, you know, something can go wrong all the time. You're faced with issues and stuff, and I'm a citizen of a, of, of a nation where things happen. I'm a world member. You know, things happen all the time. How do I keep myself sane in the midst of insanity? I figure out attitude is everything, but how do I develop an attitude that is okay? A number of things. One, I have figured out that the devil is not as powerful as he's made to be. Oh, let me try this side. Maybe I will have a Christian on this side. The devil is not as powerful as he's made to be. He's not. Why? 
The theology of 1 John 4.4 John 4 is a real theology where the Bible says, He who is in me is, come on please, He is, then, who is in you? Who is in the world? Who is in you? Who is in the world? Who is the greatest? Now if the one in me is greater than the one in the world, why is the one in the world worry me? Hallelujah. Many times when the devil tries his best shot, I say, are you done? Punch me again. Hit the hardest you can hit me. And when he finishes, I say, I'm still standing. <laughs> oh, my God, my God, my God, my God. I'm still standing, I'm still standing, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. When the enemy does his worst and you are still standing, he's out of job. You've cried enough. Don't cry anymore. Don't cry anymore. I had a beautiful story of a lady. She's a calm, temp, you know, tempered woman. And then the husband was very abusive. He will abuse her and threaten her to chase her from the house and, you know, bring her back to her parent. And then she, she was very, very quiet. One, two, three, four years of that abuse going on. One day comes exactly as he was coming, every time. He goes, listen, I've had enough of you. You have to go to your parent. Finish. I'm tired of you. Actually, I don't feel anything for you anymore. In a quiet demeanor, she just said, my husband, are you sure? Don't ask me questions. You, you know, just swear that a woman. She kept quiet. The last word she told her husband, give me three days. The devil will be scared in his boots when your behavior changes. <laughs> she just said, give me three days. That's all she said. The guys kept doing what he was doing. She did, he didn't know. She was packing her stuff slowly. And when he's at work, she was moving little by little things to her parents. On the third day he comes from work, there's no wife, no children. Gone. To this day, it had been two years. You don't need to panic. Jesus is big enough. Whatever punch the devil will punch you, you can still stand. That for me has helped me. Things will come. As a human being, I'll, I'll, I'll be shaken. But once I get into my spirit and I go, Jesus lives inside of me. Finished. Unless I did something that made my Jesus angry, I will have to repent and correct. But if in my conscience I know I didn't do anything, and then this is the craziness of the devil, I just say he is stronger and bigger than the one in the world. I go into a very chilled mood. The second thing I preach to myself for my attitude to be correct when I'm faced with really, really big challenges is this. Many of life experiences are only temporary in nature. Nothing lasts forever. You know, sometimes ago we remind, remembering with mama, you know, we have only one parent left. You know, three of the two sets of parents are gone. And it was painful when they died. You know, my dad, uh, uh, my mom, uh, my father-in-law, and then my mom. Uh, very, very painful. And then we will go through a season of pain. And then one day, that grip of pain just leaves you. And I asked my wife, did you realize that, you know, when we talk about a parent, it's just normal, it's a history. And then she said something I never thought of. This is how God has designed pain, that it doesn't last forever. Otherwise, we will all die with pain. Yeah. Yeah. 
Come on. Hallelujah. Whatever happens, you know. Actually, for people who have been around me for a long time, I'm a very relational person. I really, I love people. I want to cling to people. The hurt of someone leaving is beyond words. I might not say it. I might pretend it means nothing. It's beyond me. It just messes up with me. But you know, the thousands of people who left me when I counted on them, I will hurt and one day I realize I don't hurt anymore. Yes. And I learn something in life. Everything that happens to me, even the worst, is not permanent. Amen. I'm amazed. Someone was, you know, okay, paralyzed, and he goes through withdrawal and all this stuff, and then one day he begins to laugh about his paralysis. What has happened? The situation has lost its grip. Yes, I'm telling someone today, your situation will lose its grip over you. Yes. Totally and completely. I teach myself. I teach myself again and again. Whatever I'm going through, it's for a season. It will pass. Amen. These two shall pass. Amen. The third thing that really helps me keep that attitude that is needed when you go through crisis, it's this what I call all is well attitude. Amen. When you begin to adopt all is well attitude, you become undefeatable. Remember the Shunammite? That for me is the biggest story. Now most of us, the Shunammite, when we see her, it's only when she said all is well when the child died. No, the all is well of that lady is a lifestyle. Remember that she was married for a long time and yet she didn't have any child. Because she said the husband was advanced in age, which means old. You know, it's just polite word. But in that space of not having a child, she still built an upper room for a prophet. She still furnished the thing. She still supported the work of the Lord. Why? All is well. You cannot be a victim and a victor at the same time. Girl, did the Lobola go through? Good. So, yeah, okay. Now I know. So we'll talk about it. All right. All is well. When the child comes and the child dies, that's the one. This is heavy. She turns to the husband. <laughs> goes, my wife, what's up? It's too early for you to go. This is not season. She goes, all is well. Wait a minute. All is not well. Because a 14-year-old boy have just died. I didn't have a child. You gave me hope, God. 14 years of joy. You take it away from me. How can I be happy? But she goes, all is well. My God, my God. Do I have somebody in the house? Do I have somebody in the house? Ooh, ho, ho, ho. God Almighty, I came, we didn't have any member. We prayed and trusted you, you brought these members to us. For 10 years, 7 years, whatever number of years, these were sons and daughters to us. Why do you let them go? I have a choice, to be bitter or to say all is well. But you know, the devil will push any button that he can for you to go into defeating emotions. Yeah. Even when the child was raised from the dead, she still went to another crisis. It was financial. All the investment taken away from her. But you know what? She said the same word. All is well. Can the devil touch your finance and you still tell the Lord all is well? Can the devil touch your education and you still say, all is well? Can the devil touch your car that you have turned into your God, still say, God is, uh, all is well? The 
The Lord knows my heart. I didn't mean to, to, to be a drug addicted, but it's to, 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 to process this pain. I found myself in drugs. Really? Are you serious? That's an issue of someone who doesn't know how to handle crisis. I told a friend in the early service, you know, what makes me laugh, not in a way of trivializing what people tell me, but is this. 90% of times people come in my office broken and crying about crisis they're going through, and I'm listening, and in my heart I'm going, if you knew that I'm sitting on fire 10 times more than this problem, you will be praying for me. But you know the difference? Some of us have decided whatever it is, it is what it is. <laughs> now, you know, let's, let's talk about the, the issue at hand, you know. Everybody was up, up on arm. People are leaving the church. Now, if people leave the church, what do you want the bishop to do? Die. Because whether live or die, living they've left. What are you feeling? Nothing. Because they're not important? No. Because if the Lord wanted them in, they will still stay. That's all. That's all. I'm, I'm super cool. Because once you develop all your well attitude, nothing can defeat you anymore. Would you ask your neighbor, why are you so quiet? <laughs> no, 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 that neighbor is not anointed. Ask the other one, why are you so quiet? Is there any issue? Another point that I've helped me a lot to deal with the issue of keeping always the correct attitude regardless of what I'm going through is just to remind myself that all of life experiences are common to men. There's nothing that has happened to you that has happened to you alone. Some people are going through the same thing. I met a young, not, not young, you know, young compared to me, but he's not young. He's grown up. Uh, in, in Germany, I was, I was doing some seminar up north, Germany. And then they gave me this guy to drive me around. And one day he told me a story. He goes, he calls me Papa. Papa, you might not know. I faced a situation where I thought my world is collapsing today. So there were siblings sent to, by their parents to Germany, all of them, uh, six siblings. They, they went to Germany to study and do this, and then all of them went there. And then there was, there was, there was a story on news, you know, where an old building caught fire and people died. So this is what happened. They realized that early morning that they didn't prepare, uh, get stuff for breakfast. He volunteered to go get the breakfast for the rest. As he left the building, the building caught fire. He said, I'm returning with the bread and everything else, and I'm seeing all my five brothers burnt. And I had to carry five coffins of my brothers in ashes to Congo. One day, we were six. The next day, I'm one. Why am I sharing this with you? Because your crisis is not your problem. It's the emotion you allow when you go through what you go through. Yeah. That makes it worse or better. But the irony of life, this guy, he said, Dad, you won't believe it. Do you know where I'm working now? I'm working at a mortuary. So which means every day it deals with dead corpse, reminding him, of five he lost in one go. He is the most committed deacon in the church. Never misses church. What's up with you? Why is the devil throwing you off balance so easily? Why is your attitude messed up with the devil by any little things that happen in your life? 
Is your issue nothing? No. But the issue is not worth you losing relationship, losing your friendship with God, losing your commitment to church, losing everything that is important. Why are you reacting that way? Not because something happened. Because you chose the wrong emotions in what happened. I've told her privately, and I'm saying it openly for you to know. One of the things I thank my wife for a lot. You know, now we've grown old. We don't fight anymore. But in our days, you know, <laughs> when we used to, when we used to, you, to be normal people, <laughs> we will do what normal couple do. You know, from time to time, uh, raise the decibel and, and the temperature. <laughs> when the temperature is raised and you sense that the gap between us is larger, she will still be in her anger cooking for me. <laughs> Maybe the only word she will tell you in three days is, your food is there. <laughs> At least I know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> I go, it's okay. Keep being angry, but let me deal with this mountain. You know. Now, what I've learned from that lesson is this. Even through crisis, there are important things we don't compromise on. It's a decency of greeting each other. It's a decency of serving the Lord. It's a decency of being a good Christian. Yes, in my anger, Lord, I'll continue serving. In my anger, Lord, I will be Christian enough to say, hi, how are you doing? Did the day go well? Because crisis is not the major issue in life. It's which emotion you open up to. Listen, I, I taught, you know, uh, many years ago at preaching. If everybody knew what, any, um, if anyone knew what everybody says about everybody, nobody will have a friend. No, that's, that was a message where I was young. It was a complicated, but I thought it was cool. And the reason I thought it was cool because I still remember it. Why? Because even the people you call the best friend, if God will ever reveal what they say when you're not around, they will not be best friend anymore. Now, let, let's even leave the issue of best friend. Do you know who are the first people who give nicknames to their parents? Children. Now, if the children were polite enough, they will, not, they will know you don't go to certain areas. Oh, the church is quiet. Now, think with me. This child will be somebody else's wife soon. Do you know what this man and your mother went through? For you to be a full, grown-up woman that someone else will look and feel, wow, this is the woman to marry? Do you know that you were not visible at the naked eyes when they started taking care of you? And then one day, simply because you can dress and you can do the modeling, whatever thing you do in life, you have to give him a nickname? That's a curse. Oh, yes, thank you for saying yes. At least I've got a Christian in the house. There are things when a child is a normal child, you know it's a zone, I don't touch, I don't go, I don't speak, because that's a place, holy ground. This is the man, your mother. Those are places where you don't go even if the devil visits you. Come on, tell your neighbor the bishop is right. Hallelujah. But do you know where we go where we shouldn't go? Crisis. A moment of crisis can shock you by the ugly part of you that you never knew he was there. From punishing God to disrespecting parents to doing insane stuff like killing and, and doing things. A guy was found, chopped to pieces, put in a plastic bag. Who did it? His wife. She could not take abuse anymore. She just decided, I'm going to slice this guy and just finish him off. When you are in a crisis, if you are not careful, you will be surprised by what you are capable of doing. Work on your attitude. 
Pray to God. Keep my attitude correct. Let's run quickly. Number two, discipline yourself to turn first and foremost to him for help. Whatever happens to you, however ugly it is, before you begin to run to people, run to God. Always. Because if you face God first, you can face anything. We don't have time. I'm, I'm, I'm running behind, uh, after time. But let's take Psalm, Psalm 28, I think. You know, let's, let me get it right. 18. 18, 28, and 29. Let's take that Psalm. You know, for me, it speaks volume to me. You know, every time I face impossible issues, I remember this Psalm. One, two, three. No, 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 no. Read it properly like a Psalm. You know, this is a guy talking to God. One, two, three. My God turns my darkness into light. Come on, come on, church. Hey, hey, don't get excited too quickly. Whose darkness was it? It's mine. The psalm writer doesn't deny this is a dark moment for me. I didn't have a lot of privileges of failing in my studies. <laughs> But I, I can relate to people who fail. You know what kills students? Is 10 months gone down the drain. Yeah. That's the killer. No, no, it's not that little paper that says, you know, you didn't do well. It is 10 months of waking up every day, facing a professor you don't particularly love and like, and then all that come to nothing, and I have to start afresh, it's called dark days. Yeah. And some of us, I don't wish, comes December, you might face those dark days. <laughs> In your heart, you know, I'm studying, I'm hanging on to the grace, but depending on what I know, this year doesn't look okay. It's headwind. But even if it's, it happens, that grace doesn't get you out of, you know, the jaw of defeat, I want to remind you, there's a God who can turn your darkness into light. Amen. Into light. Verse 29. That's, that's a super verse. One, two, three. With my God, I can scale a wall. It looks impossible. It is an impossible proposition. But because God is with me, every obstacle can be surmounted. Are we together? That should be your approach. You hit a crisis, don't go berserk, turn to God first. Many times, the, you know, I've, I've faced tough stuff, really, serious stuff. And when I pray, the Lord will speak a word. And every person of the situation goes right there because he spoke. Some of us, we get into more trouble because we react first and we start praying when things have gone wrong. Pray first. That's the whole KGF stuff. It's to teach us how can you create a Re automatic reaction, reaction that when something happens, you go vertical first. A normal Christian, you, when they press your button, you should go vertical first. Whatever you tell the Lord, tell him. Lord, as I'm standing in prayer right now, I feel like killing that sister, strangling her, you know, cutting her to peace, sucking her blood, drinking it, you know, doing a just whatever thing it is, tell the Lord, you know, I want to do a barbecue with that sister because she does. Once you finish, then the Lord will say, she's not worth barbecuing. Then the whole pressure comes down. Hallelujah. Come on, give him praise.
Number three, define clearly the matter you are dealing with. When you hit a crisis, please, please, please find out first what is bothering you. What is the problem? Because some of us, you are so caught up in emotion, we don't even know what is the issue. <laughs> Remember the people in Jericho, the elders, when they went to see Elisha? They were able to define clearly the issue. Our city is a problem. Everything we plant, crops are not coming. Our women are, are having miscarriage all the time. Things look okay, but they're not. And then we know what causes it. The waters are not okay. Then Elisha could say, take me to the spring. But if they thought the problem was miscarriage, and you keep the same water. <laughs> Sometimes your problem is not a problem. Oh God, oh God, I don't have money. Oh God, I don't have money. God says your problem is not money. Your problem is the way you interact with money. Every time you get it, even projects you didn't have, they're born. Today's the 19th. Some of you will be paid on the 25th. In your mind, there's nothing. But I can prophesy, on the 25th, you shall receive an idea on how to spend your money. Because the people are never happy until they finish it. Then it's like someone coming from a war. <sighs> now, brother, today is the 25th. You still have five days to clock this past month. Then start the new one. You are breathing already heavily on the 27th. How are you going to finish? Now you sit with that TV, you cannot enjoy it anymore because the TV is making you angry. Why did you buy it? What did you do before end of the month, before the TV came in? You don't have a financial problem. Your problem is emotional. You need deliverance. So don't go to God and pray for money. Come to God. Say, Lord, set me free from this heart that is never happy with what I have. Come on, please, give him praise. Let's begin to wrap. I, got a, I think I shared with you, a lady called Kenneth again, Papa, you know, you know, he's writing in his book on the Holy Spirit. Very, very in the middle of the night, you know, the way he was to it. Hey, pastor, please, please, you know, I'm getting married. Can you please pray for me, you know, that this fifth husband, you know, behaves well? That, yeah, <laughs> Kenneth wrote in his book. Then Kenneth again responds to the wife, uh, to that woman, a member of a church. Say, but my dear sister, what do you think is a common denominator between the five husbands? <laughs> he said, it's you. <laughs> Husband one, you, divorce. Husband two, you, divorce. Husband three, you, divorce. Four, divorce. This one too, if you don't change, you will end up in the same. Define your problem. Oh, nobody loves me. Every relationship, they betray me. Common denominator. You. Could it be that your relationship fall apart because your nose goes where you shouldn't be going? What did they say? You know, some people don't want to see people three together. Huh? Now, <laughs> sister, please, can, can you go? You know, <laughs> I heard something. You heard what? <laughs> I'll not tell your neighbor the reason why you're not reacting. You know yourself. You know yourself. Come on, give him praise. Come on, give him praise. Let's finish, let's finish, let's finish. Number four. Are you learning something today? Yes. Number four. Decide to resist the temptation to, to play the blame game. You will never succeed in turning your crisis around if you start finding who to blame. Right. It started with Eve. 
and Adam. Now, this crazy king, there's famine, people are dying, and the wife says, we've been just cooked, uh, we, we cooked my, my child, now this one uh, doesn't want to cook. That's a major crisis. But you know how we react? God will treat me, be it so severely, if today, before end of the day, I don't kill Elisha. Now, what is the problem if Elisha in anger? Because you are the king who brought the problem. Many times when you don't, if you want to face someone who's a defeated somebody, it's when someone starts blaming other people for what is happening to him. Now, let me share what I shared with my friends in the early service. You know, I'm going through studies because you're doing exams. You know, some of you, some have finished. Now, you cannot come and tell me that the reason why you didn't pass your exam because the professor didn't know how to teach. This guy cannot teach. Everybody knows about him. Now, okay, okay. Shh. Everybody knows about him. I, I, I give it to you. How many were you in the class? 30. How many people passed? 25. How many failed? Five. Now, he cannot teach, but 25 people can understand what he's teaching. And to make it worse, the five people who failed, you are all friends. There's something wrong. The reason why things are going, the way going, it's apartheid. Wait a minute. When did apartheid stop? Mandela was already in power 24 years ago or so. So, or 23. Plus, when it went. Now, the last time I checked your ID, you were only 21. So, which means even in a dream, you didn't see a pattern. <laughs> now, why would you blame it for what you're doing? I know you will not say amen. Actually, by the way, you're very angry at me. You go, you know, the reason why I don't like Bishop is when he starts doing things like this. <laughs> would you turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, don't blame me. I'm not your problem. You are your own problem. Come on, give him praise. Some, some preacher went to New York and they found this guy, very, very slim, and he's telling them that, Pastor, this is not the way I am. You know, I used to be a strong and big guy. And then the pastor goes, But what happened? See, the women are married. <laughs> now, <laughs> he married an American lady. So, what, what? Is she beating you? Is she, you know? He said, no, she makes me cook. <laughs> she makes me do the, you know, laundry and, and stuff. And that's why I'm losing weight. <laughs> now, dear brother, let's talk. When you're marrying an American, <laughs> didn't you know that it's written? In America, equality is more important than anything else. If both of us go to work, both of us have to do house chores. Before you say I do, check the background of the country. <laughs> Hello. There are some tribes where it's not a problem for the wife to beat the husband if he misbehaves. Well, if you go marry, be prepared to be beaten once or twice. You know, it, it's, it's just part of life. <laughs> Hallelujah! Well, not in Christ, not in Christ. In Christ, sisters in Christ don't beat the brother. Can all the sisters say amen? Yes. Thank you. Please do me a favor. For the sake of Christ and your bishop, don't beat the brother. Just leave them alone. Now, by the way, you brothers, this is not part of the preaching. I'm just, you know, concluding. By the way, you brothers, remember this. It's not because she's weak. 
Some of you, she just refrains <laughs> from doing something. These new women, they study karate and judo. They can, do, my word. They've learned exactly which part of the body to touch, but then that way you know you are down. Oh, sister, 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 gone. <laughs> so be careful. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, what, where is your wife? Where is Lindy? Okay. She came to early service. You know, his wife, she's an officer in military. Ah, well, you don't get to that for nothing. That two, two things or three, they learn. You know, when the enemy comes, this is what you do first. So, you know, it's just out of Jesus that she goes, okay, just leave him. <laughs> but if you keep becoming an enemy, she will pull one of those techniques. <laughs> But brother, what happened? Why is your eyes swollen? Oh, no, no. I, you know, I hit myself against... Oh, we know these things. Amen. Are you ready for the last one? Good. The last one, if you want to turn any, anything around, whatever Christ says, determine to wait for the Lord regardless of how long it takes. Uh, I learned something. You know, I was really trying to understand this thing of waiting on the Lord because that was the verse 33 of the story we read. You know, the king goes, why wait for the Lord? Because, you know, the Lord did it to us, but it's not true. Whatever crisis, if you can just wait for the Lord, it will turn around. You know, I wanted to understand what is the meaning of wait for the Lord. And then as I finish praying, I say, okay, let me be quiet and let the Lord speak to me. And I switch on the channel. Joyce Meyer was giving a teaching and he was she was teaching class on waiting for the Lord. And just as you opened the TV, she was explaining what it means. She said it's expecting the Lord to do amazing things for you in the course of time. Even if it doesn't look amazing now, expect that before I leave this planet Earth, the Lord will do something amazing. That's what expecting. Did you learn something today? Yes. So may these five points help you turn around any crisis. Yes. Remember, crisis is not the major issue. It's the emotion you allow in solving the issue that either makes it worth or finds a solution. May we adopt the right attitude. Yes. Can I pray for you? Our Father and our God, it is with excitement that you have shared this word. We didn't have time to finish, Father God, the story, but I have preached already on the four lepers, which was an amazing thing. People who have part of the body is missing, sometimes feet missing, and yet as they begin to walk, there were only four of us against them, a huge army that have besieged a country for, for, for many, many, many months. But Lord, you made the enemy here, chariot, running around and leaving all the sports behind. When we trust you enough, the impossible will become possible. You're going to turn around every situation and any situation that you are facing because you know with God, we can scale a wall. We give you praise and honor because you are our Jesus and our Lord. As Pastor Oliver comes up, O oh Lord, and give us an opportunity probably to make you a personal Lord. You will open our hearts because life cannot be done without you. So that together we grow to understand that this is what you call us for. As you look forward to Thursday for our KGF to learn again how we can turn to you automatically when life squeezes us, O oh God, and live under an open heaven. Teach us these things. I bless your people. And I pray particularly those who are going through a rough time. That Lord, the devil will not defeat them. The devil will not preach to them that the situation they cannot come out of it is a liar. I prophesy you will come out of any and every situation to the glory of God. Amen. Receive. Receive your breakthrough. In 
Jesus' name.